Hey, family, I hope everybody is doing well out there in the digital world. And if you're just jumping into the chat room, make sure to let us know where you're tuning in from. We would love to know. I love that technology allows us to connect, even if we're separated geographically. And my name's Tyler. I know I'm not Pastor Troy. Uh, I'm still PT, Pastor Tyler. You get second best uh, today. But Pastor Troy is going to be bringing a great word shortly. But again, we're so excited that you're jumping in and choosing to do life with us here at Potential Church. I know that Pastor Troy has a word that is going to encourage us. It's going to challenge us um, and it's going to inspire us to take those steps and become who God has called us to be. And I am here live at our Cooper City campus uh, in South Florida and I am in the studio and I'm just excited about what God's doing in the life of our church. I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. And again, if you're just tuning in with us, we'd love for you to jump into the chat room. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, and we would love to pray for you. And I'm excited because we are in our Broken Vows series. And it's been an incredible series. Really been enjoying it. And this weekend, Pastor Troy is talking about how your marriage can survive a financial storm. You know, statistics prove that the number one reason that people get divorced is over finances. It causes so much tension and can cause so much um, dissension within the home. And Pastor Troy is going to give us some practical tools and principles from the Word of God that when we put it into practice, when we live it out, it can help our marriage survive any financial storm we may experience. Because the truth is, God wants you to have a prosperous marriage. He wants you to have a rich marriage. He wants you to have a marriage that is a true picture of his love for all of humanity. That's what marriage is designed to be. And I'm excited to gather around God's word. And I want you to be encouraged because when we gather around the word of God, there is strength for the taking. There is strength in the taking. And so let's get our notes ready. Let's get our Bibles ready. Maybe grab a cup of coffee and let's posture our hearts. As a matter of fact, let me just pray for us before we hear this word together. God, I come to you right now and I thank you for every person that's tuning in from the other side of the camera. God, wherever they may be, I thank you for their life. I thank you for their purpose, their destiny. And I pray right now, God, that you would seal this word in their hearts. We declare that as your word goes out, it will not return void. It will accomplish what you've intended and purposed in the heart and life of every individual, God. So speak, your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Well, we love you guys. And uh, let's hear this incredible word from Pastor Troy Gramley. And Father, I pray right now for everyone who's watching, room or wherever they are, they would just sense your presence. Amen. Glad you guys are here today. You know, hurricane season is just a few months away, and every year as we approach it, you think about the different storms that you've been through. And of course, if you've lived here very long at all, you may remember Hurricane Andrew, which was a Category 5, hit a little bit further south than where we're at live today. I don't know where you're watching from online. But I look back on that August, and I discovered that 63 1,500 homes were destroyed. And when you look at the pictures, you see just total neighborhoods that were once there that are no longer there. Many of you may have moved up here as a result of Hurricane Andrew a few decades ago. It created $27.3 billion. In today's dollars, it'd be $57 billion in damage. It killed 65 people, a, a horrific storm that um, brought about great destruction. And as a result of those storms, uh, they decided we would build homes differently, right? They changed the code so uh, to withstand uh, certain types of storms. I grew up in Arkansas. And of course, we didn't have hurricanes in Arkansas. We had tornadoes. And what was always interesting about a tornado is that when one would come on one side of the road might be total destruction and on the other side of the road there might be nothing wrong. Some of it had to do where the winds were the strongest and some of it had to do how the homes themselves were built. Were they up to code or not? And 
You know, there's one storm that statistically every relationship, every marriage is actually going to go through, and it's a financial storm. In other words, we all have to deal with finances in one way or another. What are we going to do with our money? We're going to put it all together. We're going to keep it separate. How are we going to spend our money? What if we don't have enough money, right? Statistically, and I put in your outline if you want to follow along, according to the American Psychological Association, financial problems are a leading cause of divorce. You know, it's one of the things that Stephanie and I, this July, will have been married for 35 years. That's a long time, right? So if you go back about 34 years, you would have heard Stephanie and I having conversations about how to build our marriage in such a way to withstand financial storms. As you heard earlier in our live stream, Stephanie's going to join me, and that's one of the things that we're actually going to talk about today at 6 p.m. Now, while money can destroy homes, it's funny, we don't often talk about it, especially inside the church. In 2004, we had one storm after another. And then in 2005, the same thing happened. If you were here then, you would put your shutters up, and then you'd take your shutters down, then you'd put your shutters up. In 2004, it was Dennis, Katrina, Rita, and then the last one we had was Wilma. Now, in the same way that government came along and said, if we're going to withstand these storms, we have to build our houses different. The same thing is true when it comes to our marriages. If we're going to withstand the reality that we're all going to have to deal with the stress of finances in some way, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to build our marriages up to code. We're going to have to do something different. And I want us to talk about how do we, how do we deal with wealth and generosity? And I don't want to just talk about wealth in the context of money although we're going to talk about the financial end of marriage, but I want to talk about wealth in every aspect of life. I wrote like this in my journal. In the same way that Scripture teaches us how to build wealth in such a way to protect us from what you might say are the financial Andrews or Katrinas or Wilma. And we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we're going to learn how to build wealth in such a way to withstand the reality of financial storms because they're going to come into our lives in one way or another. And if we don't know how to deal with them, if we don't build up to a biblical code, it will destroy marriages. It'll be the beginning point. It'll be where the arguments start and the conversations or communication actually ends. So let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse number 11. And like I said, the scripture and the outlines on the app, and it's up on the screens as well. He says, make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules, his regulations that I command you today. In other words, the scripture is there to help us succeed, and he's just reminding us to not forget that. And then he says, make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, when you build pleasant houses and settle in. In other words, when you start to progress, when you start to succeed, when you graduate college, when you get the promotion, right? Once the, the, the kids are, are, are born, right? Things seem to be kind of going in the right direction. He says, when you see your herds and your flocks flourish, right? That was their job. So when you, you get the business off the ground, right? When you start to experience success, more and more money, starts to come in. He says, watch your standard of living go up and up. He says, okay, here's what you got to do. Make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God, your God, the God who delivered you from Egypt, uh, from slavery, uh, the God who led you through the huge and fearsome wilderness, the desolate badlands crawling with fiery snakes and scorpions, the God who gave you water gushing from a hard rock, the God who gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never even heard of, in order to give you a taste of the hard life, to test you so that you'll be prepared to live well in the days ahead of you. Now, if you start thinking to yourself, I did all this, and all by myself, therefore I'm rich, you know, it's all mine, well, think again. 
Remember that the God, your God, who gave you the strength to produce all this wealth, right? Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth. Why? To confirm or to keep his promises um, as he did to your ancestors as he does today. You know, after Hurricane Wilma, after any hurricane, you go out and you clean up. One of the things at the church, we always have a group of people who will gather and they bring their chainsaws and their pickup trucks and all those kind of things to help people get their, their life, their house, their yard back in shape. And Wilma was kind of our first real, we had lived here, I guess, uh, about four years at the time, and that was the first real hurricane. I think it was a Category 3 and it had messed up some of our shingles, and it had messed up uh, our screen door. Uh, we had a screen door. Let me show you a picture, because you like kind of like that. You guys know what I'm talking about? And the wind had bent it, made it so it wouldn't shut just right. And so I thought, well, I'll just take it off and, um, and get a new one. And so made this big pile in the front of the yard. It had all the branches that broke, and it had that door. And then I went upstairs and I looked at my insurance policy and I saw how big my deductible was. And I went back out and I got the door and I put it back on its hinges, all right? I, I, I didn't uh, realize exactly what was going on. I had a lot to learn. And the same thing is true when it comes to wealth building. The scripture has something to teach us. Now here's the first thing if you want to jot this down, is that wealth isn't evil. Wealth isn't evil. Often within the church, we're afraid to talk about wealth or success or flourishing, right, or God's favor, whatever word you might use. And yet, we read just a moment ago that God said he is the one who gives us the ability to actually produce wealth. And so it's important for us in our thinking that there's nothing spiritual about apathy that poverty nor being rich or being poor right determine or reveal our spirituality there are folks who are living in poverty who are close to God and who are a long way to God and there are folks who are rich that are close to God and are a long way to God see we even sometimes within the church would say that the desire to build wealth is selfish or that it's evil. But that's not what the scripture teaches us. The scripture teaches us that God's actually given us the ability, the strength, in order to do that very thing. So, not, and again, this is the way I wrote it. Not only is wealth building not evil, but we have a responsibility as Christ followers to pursue it. God didn't give you nor me an ability to do something that he then assumes we're going to sit down on that we're not going to engage with. Because see, if we'll bring our finances up to code, it allows us not only to protect ourselves, but also to help others. If your house doesn't get blown down in the midst of a hurricane, then you're able to go help somebody who, whose home may have not been up to code or whose trees got blown over. And the same thing is true when it comes to our relationships. When our marriages are built to code so as to be able to withstand the financial storms that come into our lives, not only have we protected ourselves, but we're better prepared to help the people around us. In other words, there's one of the great benefits of being a Christ follower. Now, there's a difference between giving, I believe, in generosity. Giving something you do, and lots of people give, but generosity or being a generous person is something you are it's part of your character therefore it takes a transformation and I want to give you some good news because the church not just potential church but the church as a whole Christians those who might consider themselves religious often get attacked for a lot of different things in our culture and in our society but it's only because we really but we don't get given the statistics and I want you to see that those of you who are a part of the church statistically here in the United States are much more generous than those who are not part of a local church 
They've done lots of research on this, and I want you to see some of it, all right? So I actually put it in your outline. According to the panel study for income, uh, uh, income dynamics, Americans who do, do not attend religious services, and it compared those to those who attended a couple of times a month. And here's what they discovered. Two, those who attended twice a month gave $2,935 to charity. Those who did not attend church gave only $704 to charity. That's a tremendous difference. In other words, it reveals what? It re reveals the transformation that God brings into our heart when it comes to generosity. Let me give you another one. In study after study, religious practice is the behavioral variable with the strongest and most consistent association with generous giving. In other words, the thing that will reveal more than anything else whether someone is generous or not is their religious practice their Christianity it says and people with religious motivations don't give just to faith-based causes because I know some of you probably already thought that well of course they give but they just give to the church no 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 in every area of life those who are a part of the church are more generous than those who aren't that's pretty cool isn't it right it says don't just give to faith-based causes. They also are much likelier to give to secular causes than the non-religious. Two-thirds of people who worship at least twice a month give to secular causes, compared to less than half of non-attenders. And not only do more people who uh, are a part of the local church give, they give more money. They give 20% more. Those who do give, who are religious and those who are non-religious those who are religious give 20 percent more than the non-religious why because believers leverage their resources for impact that's why it's important for us to be able to build wealth bill gates you've probably heard of him right the big microsoft guy well today he's not known you know for microsoft he's known for his charitable giving his foundation and notice this Members of U.S. churches and synagogues send four and a half times as much money overseas to needy people every year as does the Gates Foundation. Now, you've probably heard about the Gates Foundation, but you probably haven't heard that the church sends four and a half times more money overseas to needy people than does the Gates Foundation. U.S. voluntary giving to overseas poor now totals $44 billion. More than $33 billion is from the government. Of course, that's yours as well, right? Because the government just sends your money. But those who voluntarily, right, who are giving to, to charity give more overseas than does our government. Um, they did another report. And they discovered that between 2003 and 2015, though, there's been a drop in charitable giving. It says U.S. households giving to charity dropped from 68 to 56 percent. Now, I would suggest to you that during those same years, there's been a decrease in the number of people who are a part of the local church as well. In other words, there is a correlation between the local church and generosity or charitable giving not only that they also discovered that wealthy people rich people give to different charities than do just the average American if you make over a hundred and forty thousand dollars in current dollars only 30 percent of their charity is connected to religion where the average American is 60%. And when I say connected to religion, I'm talking about giving to feed the hungry, to help the poor, to also share the gospel. But those who are wealthy, as they discover, give to colleges, art galleries, and uh, organizations like that, as opposed to the lost and the least and the hurting. Now, I wanted to share and show you because it's important for us to get into our minds that wealth is not evil and poverty is not spiritual, okay? And I wanted to remind you of just some of the impact that you've had. You know, for the last few years, there's been this war, horrible war in the Ukraine. And 
um, I want, want to show you one of the uh, missile ta uh, attacks that happened not too long ago to one of the local churches uh, there. And you can see there's all kinds of destruction. You can go online to see the destruction. But in the midst of that destruction, the church, which is a light to the community, which gives hope. And if you remember, what was it, just over a year ago, we received an offering. And many of you gave to that offering to help the hurting in Ukraine. One of the things we did is that we were, you know, we got the train to rescue some of those children. The other thing that you're helping to do is to rebuild the local church, which is the hope of that community. And I wanted to show you just one of those churches being rebuilt. My friends, here I am in Poltava. Peter Kovalenk. Look at him, Peter. Who is he? Peter Kovalenk. Pastor Andre. Hey, Pastor Andre. Yeah. Andre. yeah. This is one of the churches that they are building during the war. The war is not far from here. It's 100 kilometers. 150 kilometers. Yeah. But here it is. Uh, see? Big church. I will show you from outside. Wonderful. Wonderful. It began during the war. And the gospel can never stop. Yes. You know, I, yeah. Again, you're part of the reason that that's happening. And it'd be so easy, wouldn't it, in the midst of a challenging time just to give up? I also wanted to show you a couple of other pictures, all right, of Dr. Elias, who we partner with, with GKPN. Those are a couple of teenagers. And then I'm going to show you a picture of him with some uh, children. Those children are part of 241 children who were kidnapped uh, by the Russians and taken into Russia. They were stolen from their homes. They were taken away from anybody that they knew and went into Russia. And again, because you guys have been generous and you've given to help Ukraine, we rescued 241 of those children, all right? And so they're back in the Ukraine. And uh, those things wouldn't happen without people being generous, without um, building wealth or creating wealth, being what God has created us to be so that we could help when there's a storm, an Andrew-sized storm there in Ukraine. And so thank you for the impact that you're having and the sacrifice you're making in the lives of those real children that maybe you'll never meet, but whose lives have been radically, radically changed. So wealth is not evil. But secondly, wealth can produce pride. And pride is destructive. Look at what he said. Remember what he said in verses 11 and 14? He said, but that is the time to be careful what, when you're progressing, when you get the raise, when you graduate from college, when you start the company, do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, his regulations, his decrees that I'm giving you. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God. Because we often do, don't we? Can I tell you when most people come to church, it's when they get to the end of their rope. It's when things are not going well. Very seldom does somebody have a great victory in their life and then engage in the life of the church so as to celebrate what God's done in their life. We get distracted because with success comes all kinds of different opportunities and distractions, right? And we go from being connected and serving to now we have the opportunity to travel. We have the opportunity to buy a second home. We've got a boat. We've got all these things which are not evil in and of themselves, but they can distract us from the very thing that God has gave, given us the wealth to do or to accomplish. And he's just saying, be careful that you don't become prideful and start to think that your success is the result of you, that you did it. Because that then enters into not only our heart, but also our marriages. See, generosity is something, it's important to develop generosity early in your life. Because it almost seems to be the antithesis of building wealth or success. 
I'm going to give, right? And so you have, it's important, you don't have to, but it's much easier to begin or implement generosity early in your life. And when they did research on this, they were surprised. The University of, of, I think it was Virginia. Yeah, University of Virginia's National Marriage Project. They discovered that generosity played a major role in the happiness of that couple. And again, I'm not just talking about generosity with their resources, but generosity as it plays out in every area of their life. The articles talked about, or the project, the study they did, that couples who scored high on the uh, generosity scale were happier than those who didn't. And here's the way they defined generosity, is the virtue of giving good things to one's spouse freely and abundantly. Giving good things to one's spouse freely and abundantly. And we could take that definition and apply it to all areas of our life, couldn't we? Right? The virtue of giving good things freely and abundantly. Because generosity is the antidote to a weak marriage. It's an antidote to greed. It's an antidote to selfishness. It's an antidote to pride. And all of those things weaken our home. So that when financial winds blow, rather than standing it tends to fall. So wealth isn't evil, but it can produce pride. And pride, as the scripture says, comes before a fall. Here's a third one. Wealth, though, requires preparation. Wealth requires preparation. God is preparing them here in Deuteronomy for the land of milk and honey, the promised land, their destiny, their purpose. And notice what he says. In verse 15, it says, The God who led you through the huge and fearsome wilderness, those desolate bad lands crawling with snakes and scorpions, the God who gave you water gushing from a hard rock. Again, what's he saying here? He said he gave you manna, and your ancestors didn't even know what it was. Why did he do all this? Why did he take you the roundabout way? Why did he give you water out of a rock instead of a big lake? In other words, God provided the water that they needed. He just didn't do it the way they thought that he would. He didn't do it when they thought he should do it. God took them the roundabout way through the desert, through the badlands. He tells them, in order to give you a taste of the hard life, to test you so that you would be what? Prepared. To do what? To live well in the days ahead of you. So that you would be prepared for your destiny, for the promised land. Because God doesn't just want you to build wealth. He wants you to be able to enjoy that success. He wants you to be able to leverage that success to make a difference. He doesn't just want to get them into the promised land. He wants them to be a witness for him once they get there. And the same is true for us. Wanted to let you know really quickly that Troy Gramling has a podcast, the Troy Gramling podcast that drops every Thursday at 8 a.m. We would love for you to check it out. He gets to interview interesting people, always bringing uh, just wise content for all of us to enjoy, but also grow from it. So make sure you check out the Troy Gramling podcast. Now back to the teaching. And so God sometimes takes us the roundabout way through challenges, through the bad lands, and through struggles. Some of us are there right now. And it's real easy when we're in the desert to give up on ever reaching the destination. It's real easy to get frustrated, to quit, to start hanging on and holding on to everything that we've got, thinking that we're actually never going to arrive. When in reality, what God's doing is God is preparing us for what he what he's promised because he doesn't want you just to get there and be destroyed by success because a lot of people are you know the result of not being prepared I, I, again I look at the percentage of people who go bankrupt after winning the lottery all right what do you think the percentage of people here's what they've found this is the low end okay said nearly one-third of lottery winners eventually go bankrupt, bankrupt within three to five years. 
Think about, they win millions of dollars, and with three to five years, uh, a third of them have lost everything. All of it is gone, according to the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards. Right, because all of us, they weren't prepared. All they did is fill out a card or pick some numbers or whatever it is that they did, and then all of a sudden they have wealth, but they weren't prepared for what they received, and instead of it uh, moving them forward, instead of it being leveraged to make a difference, it actually destroyed them. Another group of people who sometimes get wealth at an early age and maybe they're unprepared for it are professional athletes. And again, this research is is heartbreaking. A professional athlete, um, what percentage of them do you think go bankrupt three, let's say, three years of retirement? By the third year of retirement, what percentage of professional athletes do you think are bankrupt? 78%. 78%. Almost 8 in 10. Now, why is that? Well, it's just because they're unprepared. And of course, I know the NBA and the NFL and the MLB, many of those organizations are trying to work hard to prepare these young men and women in how to deal with the wealth that they're going to get over, the, over their lifetime or over the time of their contract. But when you and I aren't prepared... It, Instead of it being a blessing, it actually becomes a curse. And so wealth demands, it requires that we prepare ourselves. In Proverbs, the wisdom writer says in chapter 13 and verse 11, he says, wealth from get-rich schemes quickly disappears. Doesn't last. Doesn't bring about transformation. It, It doesn't prepare a home for financial storms. Instead, it's a storm itself. Uh, But wealth from hard work grows over time. And so what does God remind us of here in Deuteronomy? He reminds us that, yes, wealth can make us prideful. It's not evil, but that we have to be prepared for it. And that the journey you're on is God taking you, not to keep you from your destiny, but to prepare you for your destiny. That's why it says don't grow weary in well-doing, because in due season you will reap a harvest. If what? You don't give up. Next, wealth is the result, though, of discipline and hard work. Wealth is the result of discipline and hard work. See, when we read this scripture, sometimes we think, well, that God is the one who gives us the ability to produce wealth. We're just waiting on it, right? Some of you are like, "Woo, God, I'm ready. Well, let's read that scripture again. He says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced the wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for he is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Notice it doesn't say he is the one who gives you wealth. He doesn't drop it into your lap. No, no, he gives you the ability to produce wealth, to create, right? You have skills, you have abilities, you have talents that are unique to you and God has created you on purpose to do something of significance and in order to get to the promised land of your life right in order to arrive at your destiny your purpose that for which you were created it's going to take discipline and it's going to take hard work and we see it over and over we read it just a moment ago right that wealth as a result of hard work grows over time So are you developing the skills that you have, the talents that you have? I mean, what's the last book that you read? Who's the last person that you talked to? What are you doing with your free time? What are you watching, right? Because if we were to evaluate ourselves and be honest about it, many of us are not in preparation. We're not building ourselves or preparing ourselves to be wealth builders, we're still just kind of hoping it'll fall out of the sky. We're we're hoping that just something miraculous is going to happen, and as a result, we'll win the lottery, right? That something good externally is going to happen that will produce wealth in our lives. But that's not what the Scripture says. It is He, God, who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And with that comes hard work and discipline. Because we have to make good decisions, Right? We can spend our way out of our destiny. 
We can go into debt out of our destiny. It takes discipline to say, here's what I have, and here's what I'm going to do with the time that I have, the abilities that I have, the skills that I have, the relationships that I have, the position in which God's put me, right? And I'm going to leverage all of these in order to prepare myself for what God has ahead of me. I wrote it like this. It's necessary for us to do the work to become trustworthy enough to receive what we're asking for. Some of us pray and we're asking God for something every day that we're not trustworthy enough to receive because we're not being obedient with what we already have. We're not being obedient with the resources that God's already put into our hands. What are we telling God? We don't have enough. If you'd give me more, I'd be obedient. If you'd give me more time, I'd be obedient. If you'd give me more education, I'd be obedient. If you'd give me better help, I'd be obedient. In other words, we're telling God that if he'd do more, then we'd do more. When in reality, if we want to create or to build wealth, then we need to be obedient with what God's already put in our hand. That we need to prepare today. And that takes hard work. That may mean you have to go to college. That may mean you have to begin reading again. That may mean you have to be intentional about who you go have coffee with and what you watch and what you listen to and how you spend your time and all of those things so that you can truly develop the skills you have so as to accomplish what God created you to do as opposed to hoping that somehow God would magically, you know, sprinkle magic over your hands so as to be successful. Right? Preparation is today. What are you preparing for? When it comes to marriage, what are you preparing for? When it comes to parenting, what are you preparing for? When it comes to starting a company, what are you preparing for? When it comes to building wealth, what are we preparing for? You know, when um, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been watching my wife, and she's been... Um, working on trading, right? She's doing all this trading stuff. And every day I watch her, after she's done all her other work, she gets her computer and her books, and I watch her study and prepare and do all this stuff. She's talking a language. I don't even know what she's saying, I told her the other day, okay? When it comes to investing and all this kind of stuff that she's doing. And here's what I know. I know that she is preparing today for where God's going to take her in the future. And there's no doubt in my mind that that destiny or that purpose she's one day going to experience, right? Because she's doing the hard work of preparation today. The Bible says, again, and the wisdom writer says in Proverbs chapter 10, lazy people are soon poor. Lazy people are soon poor. Now, the problem is, is we tend not to see ourselves as lazy, but I just want to challenge you. What are you doing to prepare yourself? Because it's, we live in a world in 2024 where it's so easy to, to convince ourselves that the reason we're not succeeding is because of an obstacle or a challenge. Obstacles are obstacles, and challenges are challenges. But there's nothing in front of you that's bigger than the God who has promised you something. Right? And so... It says, lazy people are soon poor, but hard workers get rich. Uh, so wealth isn't evil, but it can produce pride. Wealth requires preparation. Wealth is the result of discipline and hard work, right? Those skills that the Bible says God's given us. Number five, wealth building is rewarded. There's a, script, there's a story we're going to look at here in Matthew 25, and what we're going to discover is that Jesus is not a socialist, all right? Because a lot of times we think that, well, let's just read it. Because in Matthew chapter 25, this CEO, you might say, all right, who's representing uh, God, the CEO is going away, and he gives some of his guys uh, five bags of silver, he gives another one two bags of silver, and he gives another one one bag of silver, right? So we know right there that's not equal, that's not fair in our world today, but that's what he does, five, two, and one. And then he goes away. And while he's away, the one that he gave five multiplies it to ten. 
And the one that he gave two multiplies it to four. But the one that he gave one to, well, he didn't do anything with it. And look what the scripture says. This might surprise you. It says, then he ordered, when he gets back, he says, take the money from this servant, the one who didn't do anything with it. He gave him one, and when he came back, he still had one. He says, take it from him and give it to who? The one with 10. That goes against everything we're told in 2024. We would think that Jesus would take from the 10 and give it to the poor dude who only had one. Maybe give some to the dude who had two and multiplied it to four, but that's not what he does. He takes it from the one. He doesn't give it to the dude who's got four. He gives it to the one who has built the most amount of wealth. He says in verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. Do you hear that? God does not feel sorry for our unwillingness to engage the gifts and talents he's given us so as to succeed. You cannot talk God into feeling sorry for you or me because we haven't leveraged the gifts that he's given us. Look, at, he says, he takes and he says, the one who succeeds, he's going to get even more, and they will have abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. That's pretty challenging, isn't it? Right? Because I can tell you in my life, it's a lot easier to convince myself that I would succeed if it weren't for some obstacle. It's a lot easier for me to convince myself that our church would be much more successful if it wasn't for this obstacle or this challenge or this difficulty. Again, the question is what? Is what am I doing with what God has given me? How am I multiplying? How am I growing what God has given me? You know, I remember... 24 years ago when Steph and I came here. We came here to do young adult ministry. And when we got here, it wasn't what I was thinking it was going to be. Uh, we didn't have anybody to lead, lead worship. There were like 12 young adults going to a Bible study, even though there were 2,000 people at the time attending the church. We didn't have a very big budget. It felt a lot more like a church start, which is what Steph and I had done in Arkansas, than it did joining a large church and, and doing the young adult service. And it was frustrating, right? And I had a choice to make in that moment. And the choice that I could make is to get frustrated and leave. I, I could leverage all the things that I thought were gonna happen, right? Is my own reason for thinking that, I'm sure. I could have left. There's a lot of things I could have done. But instead, Steph and I decided that we were going to use what God had given us in that moment. And we had no idea at the time that the lead pastor was going to, to leave, that God had called him to do something else, and that we would get the opportunity that we have had for the last 22 years. But the only reason Steph and I have had that opportunity and the impact that it's had on our lives and the lives of our family is because we did something with what we had in that circumstance. The same is true for all of us. There are times in my life when I've done just the opposite. I'm 56 years old, and June the 9th or the 11th, I can't remember, my first book is coming out. Now, I'm excited about that. Woo! But the only reason it's coming out when I'm 56 as opposed to when I was 36 or 46 or 26, is because I didn't use what God had given me at that time. And it's cost me time and opportunity and decades. See, the question that we all have to be honest about is what are we doing with what God has given us? And lastly, is not only does wealth building, is wealth building rewarded, but generosity is what powers Wealth building. Uh, let me show you what I mean, all right? Because, and here's the, this is good news. Because generosity is something that we can all implement where we are. 
You don't have to get somewhere and then become uh, generous, right? Let, let's go back to the same story, Matthew chapter 25. It says, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more. And he said, master, you gave me five and I've multiplied it. And I've earned five more. And the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear that? You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'm going to give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. That's God putting that narrative there to remind you and me that if we're responsible with what's in our hand, he will give us more opportunities. But then it says, then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I, I knew you were a harsh man harvesting crops, and I, I, I didn't plant gathering crops you didn't cultivate, and I was afraid I would lose my money. I, I was afraid. And how many times do you and I do the same thing? We're saying, God, give us more because we're afraid that we're going to lose what we have, and what we have is not very much. It would be a lot easier to be a generous person if I had a million dollars in the bank as opposed to ten dollars in the bank. That's exactly what this dude's saying. He said, I only had one. And I knew, God, that you held us to account. And I was afraid that I would lose it. And as a result, I buried it and I hid it and I put it into the ground. And many of us are in the same situation Rather than taking what God's given us and following him with confidence and passion, and we're hanging on to it with all of our might. And look at, look at God's response. He says, look here. Here's your money back, the dude tells him. But the master replied, you're a wicked, lazy servant. Why? Because you didn't do anything with what I gave you. And you can hear him saying, but you only gave me one. If I'd have had five, I could have done the same thing. But I only had one. I only had one gift. I only had one talent. I only had one education. I only had one amount of resources. What is our excuse today? Why is it that we stand before God trying to convince him that he's the reason why we haven't succeeded? Why we haven't accomplished what he's called us to do? God's response to me and you is that we're lazy. We're wicked. We don't trust him. So how do we get, how, do we, how are we empowered? Because remember what he said, that your God gave you the strength. I, I wrote it like this. What you do is determined, okay, when you're building wealth, what we do is determined by our faith, or you could say our connection to God. One of the great benefits of being a Christ follower is that you and I don't have to go about this alone. We don't have to take that step of faith alone. We don't, I, no, no, we, we're empowered by our connection to God. So I want us to look at a scripture in a way that maybe we've not looked at it, okay? It's a pretty famous scripture when it comes to generosity and giving, but I want us to look at the first part because we tend to just look at the last part of Malachi 3. So let's, let's read it, starting in verse 7. He says, God speaking, he says, return to me or connect to me, All right? You, you've drifted. You're no longer following me. You're no longer being obedient to my word. You've convinced yourself that I'm old-fashioned. You've convinced yourself that I don't have anything of, of value to say. So he says, return to me or, or connect to me so I, in turn, can connect to you. And they ask maybe the same thing that we would ask. Well, God, how do we, how do, we do that? I thought we were. I mean, how, how do I plug into you so as to have the faith and the confidence in which to pursue my destiny? And God says what? We'll begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. You ask, how have you robbed me? And the, he says the, the tithe and the offering, right? We, we know the tithe means 10%. He says, that's how. And now you're under a curse, the whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. And he says, here's how you fix this. Here's how you connect or return to me is bring your full tithe to the temple treasury. There'll be ample provision in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you. Pour out a blessing beyond your wildest dreams. And then he talks about how he will defend them. And we always spend a lot of time there, right? God opening up the windows of heaven and he's pouring out a blessing so big that 
We don't know what to do with. He's protecting and defending us. But this text is here because God's desire is to do what? What is this all about? It's about connecting with him. That's where it starts. God's saying, you're not connected to me. And because you're not connected to me, you're unable to accomplish what I've created you to do. You're unable to go where I created you to go, to experience what in the New Testament Jesus died for us to experience. I think of it kind of like my cell phone, right? Most of us have a cell phone. And the thing that's important when it comes to a cell phone is what? Is that you plug it in. But not only do you have to plug one end to your phone, you have to plug this end into the wall, don't you? Right? If it's not plugged into the wall, the phone doesn't get powered up. The battery doesn't become recharged. And so it's important at night to look and see if the light's on. Because no matter how well intended I am, if I don't plug it into the wall, it won't charge. I've also noticed this. Have you ever been without your charger? How do you treat your phone when you don't have a charger? A little different, don't you? You, you, you don't go to YouTube quite as often and you turn down the brightness level. You, you don't go to, you know, all the different links, right? In other words, you start holding it a little bit tighter because you've only got a limited amount. Why? Because you can't plug it in to the wall. You can't plug it into the power. And so you become quite conservative, maybe even selfish. Somebody says, hey, can I borrow your phone? No, no, I'm sorry, I don't have my charger. I, I, I think that's exactly what Malachi is trying to teach us. Because we respond the same way. When we're not plugged into God, what do we do? We become very conservative. We're like, oh, man, oh, I, I'd love to help you. I just, I just can't. I mean, I'd love, I'd love to have been a part of those who gave to the offering of the Ukraine. But you got to understand, I'm a single parent. you got to understand, I just lost my way. Whatever it is, is that we're not plugged in. And because we're not plugged in, we're afraid that we're going to run out. And so we live our lives as if we don't have a charger. And so what does the scripture say? He says, come to me. Return to me so that I can return to you and do what? Empower you. And what's the little light that lets us know whether we're plugged in or not? Well, he, he told us. What did he say? Bring the tithe and offering. Our generosity reveals whether we're truly plugged in or not. Because see, if you're plugged in, you can live a generous life. Why? Because you know who gave it to you. <laughs> and he's got plenty. See, if you've you got the cord to your phone, you can let other people use it. You can turn the flashlight on and keep it on for hours. Because all you got to do is plug it back in. And the same thing is true as a Christ follower. When you're truly plugged into God, offering is not a time when you escape out the back door or you talk about hypocrites or whatever it might be. When the dude on the side of the road need some help you don't look the other way why because you know <laughs> he's got plenty and the whole reason that he gave it to you and me is so that we can leverage it to have impact what a great way to be alive see until we realize that God owns 100% of it, we'll never be able to return to him 10%. I think the reason we steal from God is because we have forgotten we have the ability to create. He's given you, right? The ability to do what? Produce wealth. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. What an incredible message from Troy Grambling today. Now, just before you go, I wanted to remind you that Troy Grambling has released his first ever book, Potential, The Uncontainable Power of God Within You. 
Go and pre-order it anywhere where you can purchase books. I guarantee you it will benefit you in so many different ways. Again, thank you for joining us today and we will see you next time. And Father, I pray right now for everyone who's watching, room or wherever they are,